Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, and to this very distinguished panel of speakers for this very interesting and I would say final but very important sector of the economy, property development, tourism, hospitality, heritage towards sustainable future, tapping, pinning, property and tourism potential. That's quite a mouthful, huh, I would say. So we would have a, a cross section of people who have got the expertise. Uh, I think what I will do is I will go according to the plan that has been given by the organizers, KSI, particularly the Secretariat, who has outlined. And according to the briefing given to me, it's the Dao style question and answers. But earlier last night during the dinner and this morning during the various sessions, uh, I was approached by the speakers saying that, hey, look, we have prepared some slides and it is better visual communication is more impactful than just giving a uh, talk. So I will modify that and give you the opportunities. You can choose whether you want to speak off the cuff uh, or you want to use the slide presentation more, for more effective. Now, I need not have to say anything about the property development sector, the property sector, uh, but the recent indication is that the property sector in the country in 2022 uh, demonstrated a trend much more impactful and more significant than it was in 2014. So notwithstanding the COVID, it looks like the property sector has rebound in 2022, not the whole of 2022, but towards the last quarter of 2022. And therefore, is there a good indication for 2023 and towards 2024 and beyond for the future that we are talking about? But the property sector is not the only one we are trying to address here. You have got tourism and hospitality. All these are bound to be in one and perhaps they are interrelated and integrated Penang as a focal point of a sustainable, green and eco-friendly and more important as the CM has outlined saying that this is a livable environment, that is Penang is a livable environment. With that introduction, uh, we would like to give the priority to, we have had His Excellency the Governor addressing us, keynote address. The luncheon address is given by the Chief Minister, none other than the Chief Minister. And we will be having an EXCO member also doing the closing address. So it gives us great pleasure to invite Penang State Executive Councillor for Tourism and Creative Economy. I think this is a very interesting creative economy. I thought everything is creative, <laughs> including the human beings, you know. <laughs> All right. So we will listen to YB Yo Soon Hin on his perspective, what he has the vision for Penang. Webby? A politician is more used to the microphone up there than to have a hand microphone. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Adosri. And all my friends, the speakers, a very good afternoon. Uh, time flies, 
and now we are entering the third month of the year 2023. And I would say that it has been an exciting ride for us, everyone, especially for the tourism industry that we see the very strong rebound after the reopening of the interna inter international borders. And during then, after the Uh, during and after the outbreak, out, outbreak of pandemic, uh, we have never stayed low and we never uh, do things slow. I have initiated uh, numerous campaigns uh, that cater to the sustainability of the industry. For instance, experience Penang, the other side of the island, Bali Pulau and Tolopahang. Uh, the opposite side of the island, Sabang Prai, and also the Muslim travel guide that showcase the hidden gems of the Penang state. Financial support had been also uh, located to assist the industry players to get through the uh, trying time. I have also spearheaded the responsible tourism campaign that uh, the first of its kind in Malaysia that to uh, serve as a guideline and also reminder to the service provider and also the choice that we need to be vigilant uh, to prevent another round of the outbreak. This is a responsible tourism. I'm confident that Penang will excel and always be the top uh, of the list for preferred destinations. This is a definite statement because we have been seeing the strong rebound of Penang state tourism. Uh, we see a sharp rise in the direct international flights and also the arrival of passengers. The number of international direct flights has increased from 10 weekly flights in November 2021 to 184 weekly flights in December uh, last year an increase of 1,740%. The arrival of international passengers rose from 7,367 for the year 2021 to 629,436 in 2022, making a significant increase of 8,445%. The number of passenger movement at Penang International Airport for both arrival and departure of domestic and international passengers too has inclined by 681% compared to the year 2021. The recovery rate is extremely pleasing, pleasing and we compare to the, to the current number to 2019 uh, that is pre-pandemic year. The total passenger movement uh, at airport making a solid uh, recovery rate, nearly 51%. We know that uh, there are two key pillars of economy in uh, Penang, that's uh, manufacturing and also service industry. And the core segment of service industry definitely is tourism. And the link between property development, or real estate, and tourism is, I would say, that is uh, intertwined, interlinked, and also inter interdependent. Um, for tourism, I would, com I would summarize tourism into uh, five components. That five A's component, what is five A's? Attractions activities, accessibility, accommodations, and also amenities. The first tourism component is definitely attractions. I believe that Dr. Chung will definitely agree to it. Uh, the attraction is always the most powerful influencer for all the other components. Uh, attraction is the first thing the tourists pay attention to. Uh, it's the start of any tourism activity. Uh, tourism attractions can be divided into two main types, natural and also man-made attractions. What is natural attractions? Like beaches, mountains, uh, 
landscape fauna, flora, safari, man-made attractions like cultural sites, uh, casinos, we do have casinos, theme parks, monuments, clubs, museums, stadiums, and so on. Um, based on these classifications of tourism attractions, uh, we can see that the definition of property development, the property sector is involved in tourism as well through man-made attractions. And the second component is activities. We represent the main factor that uh, can make any ordinary tourism trip become extraordinary. And the tourism activity can be physical and also non-physical. And the third component is accessibility. Uh, it's very clear. It's a, uh, accessibility means that infrastructure, uh, transportation means that bring tourists to the place, to the destinations. Um, accessibility and mobility for different properties are divided into three main groups, surface, uh, such as roadway and railways, air, flights, and water transportation. And the fourth component, accommodation. It's very clear, accommodation refers to place of uh, accommodation where tourists can stay, for instance, hotels, get house, homestay, motels, uh, trace villages. Therefore, these accommodation units are literally express real estate as they are considered physical properties that have a specific use and clear and predefined facilities and they can be sold or rented. And amenities, amenities are the fifth components present the variety of facility and services required by choice and also associated to the uh, aforementioned four components. Amenity includes, but not limited to food, recreations, uh, entertainment, multi-purpose hall, uh, picnics, uh, signage, uh, other sport facilities, uh, gyms, fitness centers, spa. All these tourism amenities uh, constantly improve, uh, which in turn will affect the value of different use of properties in the tourist at, uh, areas. And it's worthwhile monitoring and also mentioning that all the highlighted five A's component in tourism sector uh, and the correlation with property development are bio-directional and also reciprocal relations. In other words, tourism and real estate mutually influence one another directly or indirectly. In Penang, we, we can see that uh, the Penang state government has provided the enabling environment that allow the tourism and also hospitality sector uh, to flourish ever since 2022. I have uh, witnessed and welcomed five new hotels in Penang, namely Amari, Spice, Escort Gurney, Bertam Resort, uh, the, the George, and the latest Citadines Connect George Town. The opening of new hotel is a very strong testament that the industry players and so investors uh, have strong confidence and trust in the prospect of the Penang tourism. Um, for the past few months, the state government is proud to witness the hotel industry experiencing a surge in business uh, with many hotels reporting high occupancy rates around 60 to 70 percent and some uh, even up to 90 or 100 percent. Um, uh, before, before that, uh, there's also uh, good news that IHG uh, Group uh, is proud to announce that the signing of partnership and also bringing inter Intercontinental Hotel to, to Penang uh, to, to revive our abandoned Mutiara Beach Hotel. I remember that Mutiara Beach Hotel uh, welcomed guests, the last guest in year 2006, something like that. So it had been abandoned for 17 years. Now I had, I had your group uh, uh, bring back and came in to, 
to revise the hotel and also to name it as an intercontinental Penang Resort. So all this has a very strong uh, proof that uh, the prosperity of the tourism uh, sector will also uh, help to boost the property development. Medical tourism is yeah, medical tourism is also one of the major uh, segments of the tourism and also economy in Penang. Uh, Penang medical tourism generates more than 50% of the national medical uh, tourism revenue. And the total revenue for Penang medical tourism has increased from 66 million in 2021 to ringgit 285 million in 2022, following the reopening of the country's borders. And while the number achieved last year has yet to surpass the pre-pandemic co uh, pre level, but the resurrection of medical tourism in Penang is very encouraging. Indonesia has always been our major source market for medical tourism, given the similarity of our culture and so our uh, language, and also attribute to our high quality of medical professionalism. In the first 11 months of 2022, Penang welcome almost 144,975 international medical arrivals, uh, of which Indonesia contributed 54%, followed by uh, South Asia, particularly India and also Bangladesh. So we will try to diversify our market in order to gain more medical tourists to our state. And Medical tourism will continue to support the growth of Penang Hotel's property sector also. We can see that the robust growth of medical tourism has resulted in the need for more hotel rooms and medical center. Medical center operators like hospital also uh, eyeing opportunities in the hospitality segment and looking to offer hotel rooms. A good example is our island hospital. They are going to build a hotel as well. So I believe there are not only more international uh, hotel chain coming to uh, the state of Penang, and also the medical service provider, they also expand their current capacity and also to, to beyond their conventional uh, provision of service, they also would like to provide uh, accommodation services, which will compete with the hoteliers. And creative economy. What is creative economy? Actually, creative economy is something uh, as long as related to the human creativity and, and contribute to the economy will be, will be named as creative economy. Before that, the, the, my portfolio is uh, arts, culture, and heritage. But I believe that art, arts, culture, and heritage should be also be integrated and also be elevated as a segment of economy that also can contribute to the GDP of the nation. So I combine arts, culture, heritage, and also integrate multimedia, uh, filming, uh, photography, design, all these uh, relations to the human creativity will be categorized as a creative economy. And one of the most uh, important segment of creative economy is filming also. I would say the diversity of Penang uh, found in its food, culture, and heritage is, kept, is so captivating. Uh, one can never forget the beauty of Penang once they were here. That's why Penang is also one of the top uh, locations for filmmakers to want and also to include Penang in their creative productions. Prominent film production companies like Fox uh, 2000 Pictures for Anna and the King and also PBS for Indian Summers uh, have chosen Penang as one of their locations to be featured in their production. The recent Hong Kong uh, movie production team for the Lock Smith had also uh, made Penang as one of their sets. These are the evidence of the versatility of Penang for being not only the choice spot, but also a place for uh, cultivate art and also to generate activity for creative economy. And with the recent uh, announcement of China, uh, 
borders, I, I am certain that they will be once again uh, to welcome the influx of more tourists from China and even from the East Asia. Um, definitely, we will reactive, reactivate our marketing programs and campaigns to attract more number of tourists to Penang. And airport, airport and also cruise terminal. The recent announcement of the expansion of the Penang International Airport is very timely. Uh, I hope that by increasing the airport capacity from current 6 million passengers per annum to 12 million uh, passengers per annum will help us to, uh, to fulfill the needs and also the demands of the tourist numbers that we can see uh, increasing every year. Likewise, the cruise terminal also, uh, the other uh, tourism property that we need to upgrade soon uh, for the tourism needs and also demands. And heritage tourism. Heritage tourism offers a chance to explore the stories and traditions of the, our ancestors to appreciate the beauty and diversity of our shared uh, cultural heritage and to support the conservation and preservation of historic history sites. Uh, adaptive reuse is a concept that has gained increasing recognition. It involves taking a heritage building that may, not, may, no, may, may, may no longer be used for its original purpose and transforming it into something that is both practical and also sustainable. Adaptive, adaptive reuse not only preserves the character and history, of a building, but also ensure that it continues to have a relevant and useful purpose in modern times. At this moment, we have a total 37 boutique hotels in Georgetown UNESCO site that have kept our heritage building very well. More upcoming new museum and art galleries and conservation project of Fort Convalis uh, with an eye for tourism later are also strong indication of tourism prosperity contribute to the property development. Despite being a Category 1 National Heritage Monument, Fort Convalis has a long time been an underperforming tourism assets, but I believe that time uh, may soon be over. Current conservation works being done, they will soon change and all that, and <coughs> our team minister will also Later, go to Fort Comedy at 6 p.m. to announce the uh, the the mod the the mod the mod uh, project uh, in front of Fort Comedies. And uh, I would say that uh, tourism is also very relevant to property segment. Sometimes our perspective uh, may be too restricted that we think that property or real estate just confined, just limited to residential. Uh, properties actually all the industry i mean especially the tourism uh, sector as long as prosperous prosperity of the tourism will help to boost our tourism will help to boost our property and also our real estate and the tourism has a very strong and also tremendous uh, potential to drive economic growth that's that's the fact that we we can't deny that the fact that we have no doubtful on it so I hope that we can explore ways to tap into the market of tourism and so heritage and while highlighting successful tourism strategy and investment opportunities. So I, I believe that uh, with the strong <coughs> and also uh, progressive performance of the tourism industry in the state, we also uh, help our property development and also uh, be a force for positive change in our country and also to bring our state to a, a different level of economic growth. So I hope that uh, this summarize uh, and so the brief uh, presentation will help, to, will help you to understand more about the, uh, the interrelationship between the tourism and also the property development. So with that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, YBU. Uh, I think it's comprehensive enough. Uh, I need not have to say anything more.
uh, I think I gave uh, an executive privilege to YBO with a little bit of extra time, uh, although I could have used my moderator's influence. But that is the strong cooperation between KSI and the state government of Penang. Well done. Now, the message that he conveys and which we all would share and echo is that Penang is a focal point for tourism, whether it is medical or related, is that it is safe, it is friendly, it is very professional, and Penang has got a lot of nostalgia as well. All this, if it can be packaged very well, it is good for Penang and it is good for the country. Well done, YBO. Next is Dato Chung Hak Teng. He is the chairman of the Association of Tourism Attractions Penang and president of CHT Networks in Dirian Berhad. And I'm sure he is going to take slightly a modified or different perspective from what a political stance could be. And over to you. You learn from the politicians, but be afraid of doing the implementation. Sorry, I'll just... Microphone. Yeah. Uh, should I just press the slide like that? You're very good looking. Yeah. Uh, I used to... Okay. This is to show that I'm good looking, okay? So it can wake you up, you know? And... Uh, Okay, this is basically, um, I'll, I'll keep it short and fast because uh, every one of you are very intelligent. So, you know, if I say something stupid, then I'll look stupid, you know. So, uh, this is this is what what our content is today. Actually, it's tourism and property. So, as I was talking to some of the speakers last night, you know, uh, what contributes to property demand? Of course, we, Penang Lang, we live here, we buy houses here, we contribute to that. No, nothing to say about that. Those that come to work here, they either rent properties or they buy properties. There's nothing to say about that also. So what's the next, next best thing? Obviously, the next best thing is tourists. The tourists that comes in. Why they should come in and after they come in, why they should stay in Penang. Why they should invest in Penang. Why they should stay in Penang. Why they should visit Penang why they should seek medical help in Penang, why they should come to uh, Penang and study. You see, these are all the value add that we have. You see, tourism is very important for that because if the first impression is no good, then people spit on it, then they go back and tell their relatives, their friends and their colleagues and say, Penang, Pui! don't bother. That's it, correct? It's very simple. So it's the first impression. It's all of you. All is the same. We make the first impression to everyone. You see, just now I stand up here, I have to make a first impression to you, making sure that you're listening to me, you're not sleeping there or playing with your handphones and everything. I'm not saying that you are there playing with your handphone, okay? Yeah. So, okay, so we need to make the first impression. So when it comes to the first impression, actually, there's only three things, you know? There's only three things. Actually, they want to, people want to come here for a balance, for an eco balance, integrated balance, you know, what are the shared value? When you come to Penang, what's special? Why you choose Penang? Why you should come to Penang and not go to America or not even go to Singapore or Thailand? You know, why choose Penang? What is so unique about Penang? That is what we need to share with the tourists. I always have this statement. For those who don't like Penang, don't stay in Penang. Don't stay in Penang and talk bad about Penang. That's very hypocrite. You know, if you want to stay in Penang, then be sure you are part of a Penang Lang, you are part of the Penang passion, and you are part selling Penang properly. You see, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not as a sweet talker. You know, when it comes to Penang, you know, I hate people talking bad about Penang. You know, so the shared value has to be there. We have everything in Penang from very good tourist attraction, international acclaimed tourist attractions. You know, we have uh, 
We have very good heritage, culture, art. You know, Penang has been an art hub since 1940s, 50s, where you know international claim names like Shi Pei Hong, Zhang Da Qian all came here. You know, we have we have an integrated culture of both East and West. Taipuzum, the ghost man from China, you know, all are here. Even if I say something like China, a lot of things were removed, were destroyed during the Cultural Revolution in China. But we have it in Penang. Why are the Indians flying over to for Taipuzum? Because we are still maintaining the culture, the heritage, the authenticity in Penang. So that's the heritage part, the art part. You know? And then we have all these new contemporary premises, attractions, and some hybrid on the heritage uh, properties and everything. So we have everything here. So the shared value, the thing is that we have to make sure that people come to Penang as a tourist for a few days will fall in love with Penang. This is called love at first sight. Only that it will contribute to the tourism, uh, sorry, it will contribute to the properties. You come already, if you like Penang, first you think that you like Penang, you want to go and visit Penang. That's the first choice. So when you come, you spend money on the attractions, the hotels, everything, that are tourism properties that you spend. If they are good, more attractions will come up. After that, if they fall in love with Penang, they might come to Penang to invest in Penang. Properties goes up again. Or they buy a house in Penang. Or they come as my second home. Property goes up again. You see? So these are all the unique factors that are creating and contributing to Penang. But if we are creating that, asking people to come, of course, the sustainability has to be there. If people come already, after two years, three years, it's gone, then people will start spitting on you again, on us again. See? So the sustainability plays a very important part for properties. Right? That is where the government comes in. We can have, that's the thing, someone made the thing for time or thing because of you drinking. Which one? <laughs> I get scared on that, you know. Okay. Uh, the, the government, we need to have a sustainable program. The government, whether it changes or it doesn't change, you need sustainability. So people that come to Penang, whether investing in a small property or a big factory, will feel confident of being in Penang. You know, we can't have a casino here today already and then tomorrow no casino, you know, if past taken over, whatever. In Genting, you know, that's what they are afraid of now, you know. So, you know, hmm. so like Penang, you can see a lot of things are coming into Malaysia. Why? Because the third one is the support and the funding. We need a stable government. Without a stable government, without a committed government, like, you know, we have a very stable and committed state government for the past few years, few terms, you know. That is what grows Penang. That is what things come in. That is on the stable side. Of course, then the safety comes in. The education comes in. And more importantly, today, moving forward, is the climate. Malaysia or Penang, in particular, has one of the best climate, which we don't have very extreme climate issues. Look at America now. We are having snow in Arizona that hasn't been snowing before. You know, we are having flood in Pakistan, you know. It's very important that not only people, but climate is on our side also. Only everything, in Chinese they call Tianzi地利人和, means the sky, the land, wow, suddenly I don't know, then the humans, everything, everything comes into a balance. When everything comes into balance, then we better rip the thing. Time. Man. Oh, okay. At least Dato Street is, is telling me the driver is waiting outside already. You better get down from the podium now. <laughs> okay, so ladies and gentlemen, in short, you know, we just need these three things. Integrated balance, sustainability, support and funding from the government. Right? So, there's nothing to tell you about Penang because Penang is a, one of the best places in the world to live in. That's why I'm here. I've traveled a lot of the countries, a lot everywhere, but 
you can't find a better place than Penang. The only thing is we need religion and politics to be separated. My name is Chung Hak Teng, Chairman of Penang Tourism Attractions. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chung. Uh, my suspicion was right. You will take a, a, a different kind of uh, perspective. I think it is good that uh, in order to attract the best, uh, I talked about the heritage aspect earlier. And this heritage trail is very unique, as you rightly pointed out, for Penang. And of course, we want to make sure that this is prevailing irrespective of the political changes that may be faced in, uh, in, uh, in Malaysia. Definitely, this is going to give us uh, an advantage, particularly in your creative area, which YB mentioned about. Uh, not only cinema, but music, art, festivals, and all that. I think this would be thoughts that would be taken back for their deliberations. Uh, in the state policy making. Now, the third speaker is Dr. Jason Theo, a partner of Henry Butcher Penang. I have to say that uh, maybe a certain element of conflict of interest because we use them as our values for a lot of work, but that doesn't make you present your views in the best way you want to see for the property sector in Penang within eight slides and within eight minutes. No phone calls will come now. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'll be very mindful of the eight minutes that I'm given, of course. And within the eight minutes, what I'm going to share with you is that when we look at the property market as a whole, basically, uh, there will be an announcement made by the research arm of the Ministry of Finance probably in the next couple of days as to how the market has performed uh, the, uh, last year in 2022 versus 2021. But based on the statistics that have been shared so far up to the first nine months of uh, last year compared to the year before, we think that there should be, we should see an increase in both volume and in terms of total value of transaction in an order of between 30 to 40%. So in other words, the market in 2022 last year did better than the year before. However, what I'm about to share with you is not going to be how the market is going to go, uh, has performed because I'd like to confine myself to two very important issues confronting the housing development market, i.e. number one, affordability, and number two, a question of oversupply or overhang. Now, let's ask, ourselves, uh, let's ask ourselves this question. How do we actually measure affordability? Well, there is a universal way of doing, doing it, and it's basically uh, called the median multiple concept. Now, what this means basically is that the median free market house price is divided by the annual medium household gross income. Now, anything above below three is considered to be affordable. Anything above three is considered to be unaffordable. And let us see where does Penang lie. Now, just to share with you very quickly, uh, anything above five is considered to be severely unaffordable. So, I mean, in other words, very, very expensive. Now, if you look at this chart over here, you will find that Penang basically is severely unaffordable, just like in KL. All right, and of course, insofar as Malaysia is concerned, it's basically seriously unaffordable at 4.4. Now, more than 70 over percent of households in Malaysia can only afford homes which are priced 500,000 and below. Now, if you look at the uh, well, we know house prices have been going up, and if you look at the um, total residential transaction for just Penang alone, which works up to about 14,000 transactions for the whole of 2022, more than 73% are basically below 500,000. And of course, there's a lot of truism that house prices have been growing faster than income, therefore contributing to a high degree of unaffordability. Now, my second issue, oh. 
uh, trying to be too fast. <laughs> Can you go back to, excuse me? Can you click down? Oh, I'm done. Okay. okay the second kidding. issue is yeah. basically uh, oversupply or overhang. Uh. Now, what does this mean? Uh? The definition of overhang is this. Um, as you know, after a building is completed, there will be issue with a, it will be issued with a CCC, Certificate of Practical Completion. And nine months after that, if it's not still sold, it's actually classified as overhang. Now, if you look at... If you look at this table, you'll be surprised to learn that Penang has got 5222 houses that falls into that category. And out of these 5,222, most of the houses which have been remaining unsold are basically those 500,000 and below. All right, worked out to be about close to easily nine, almost reaching one billion worth of real estate that has been unsold. Now, if you look at the overhang of completed residential unit by types in Penang, by far, of course, it will be, the, it will be basically the high-rise comprising both condos and, and uh, flats. And uh, you'll be, you'll be, you will ask yourself this question, where are basically they, where are these uh, overhang being distributed in Penang? Is it in Penang Island or is it on the mainland? All right, that will be the question that we may want to ask. And you'll be surprised about uh, quite a fair bit of them basically are located in DTL where we are here right now. I think I've uh, used up my eight minutes. I'm very conscious of my time and thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think uh, within the time prescribed, uh, you have made your two points very, very, uh, I would say, instructively. First, affordability. I think it is not only a Penang issue, it's a national issue. Where land is scarce and people want to be as close as possible to the urban centers and the transport locations, then you have got this problem of high prices and it is not affordable. And income, as you rightly pointed out, is not rising. And earlier in the, in the, in the summit, we talked about this nuance of the middle income trap. And the income is not going to go up in the next uh, few years or even in the decade. So you've got this problem. But this problem of overhang, the second point that you mentioned, is a very serious problem. There seems to be a mismatch between the demand and the supply. There seems to be an oversupply, and particularly the oversupply of very high-end market, which was depending on foreign buyers and incentives that are being offered as part of the promotion exercise. With the COVID scenario, I think this also has been very much disrupted, the effect of which is seen in our southern state of Joho and so on. So thank you very much, Jason, for yours. And then uh, I move on to my left or not your right, Saleha uh, Yusuf. Uh, she's the only lady. We should have had more representations from the women's sector, but she would be as brilliant as three other people on the panel. So Saleha is actually an executive director regional head and research and consulting of Nawawi, the, the, the property uh, consultants. So she would have a very balanced view, I believe, about what we are talking in the property sector and also the related real estate development. Over to you, Zalea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I guess most of the points that I have prepared today have been mentioned in the morning in, and then also during lunchtime. And just now, uh, Dr. Jason also uh, has highlighted some of the key points uh, in the property market. So what I will do uh, in less than eight minutes, I will just focus on two points. Um, tourism, 
medical tourism and also heritage tourism, which I think why people are coming to Penang. Okay, in terms of um, healthcare and wellness, based on the studies that we have done quite extensively, uh, the multiplier effect of building a hospital is quite significant, especially if you are building smart hospital. When I say smart hospital, smart uh, a hospital equipped with digitalization, AI, and all those robotics. This is a study done uh, in the European countries and also US. Yeah? So based on the numbers that I have, um, for every one bed of hospital, direct impact of building a hospital is about 3.4 employment, meaning within the hospital itself, one, one bed, will create 3.4 jobs. And then there are also uh, indirect and also induced impact, which is about 1.65 jobs. So meaning in total, you would have about five, uh, four to five jobs uh, when you build um, one bed per hospital. So imagine if you are building 300 beds per hospital, there would be more than 1,000 jobs to be created uh, in the particular area. So in many of the townships that uh, I have worked on, uh, one of the key components that we see as a catalyst in the township development is provision of healthcare services. Because in many cases, um, for example, if you are building a 2,900 acres of a township, definitely uh, there would be a demand for medical services within that particular area. Because in terms of willingness to travel, people are normally willing to travel less than 30 minutes to go to a good uh, quality medical center. So because of that, in many of the new township, if we try to estimate market gap for healthcare services, definitely there would be a gap. So, uh, which is why I think, um, because Penang is very strong in medical tourism, and I think, uh, I know many developers in Penang, especially in the mainland, uh, uh, building new township. So perhaps uh, health, uh, integrated uh, healthcare and wellness center could be one of the catalysts uh, that could attract uh, a lot of uh, demand for commercial and also residential space in the township. Okay. And then uh, the next item uh, that I would like to highlight is in terms of uh, heritage tourism. Uh, for me to be part of this team, I bought quite a few books uh, on Georgetown and also Penang uh, travel. And then I also um, sent a few of my team members uh, to come here and do research. So what we noted that there are 85 places of heritage value that can be visited. And I did not know that there are that many. I thought there are only a few. But when I look at the list compiled by my team members, it's about 85 heritage buildings or sites. And then when we talk about heritage, in terms of the impact on the economy, uh, for example, if you build a hotel, the multiplier, direct multiplier effect is about 1.5, meaning one room will create 1.5 jobs for that particular hotel. But uh, employment in the hotel will also create direct and indirect impact, uh, induced impact in the economy. So definitely there would be additional job uh, within that uh, particular economy. Just to give an example, um, in Vietnam, uh, what we discovered, a hotel has also gone into farming. So because they want to make sure they have a consistent supply of vegetables and fruits, same quality every time, uh, so that their guests will not be disappointed. So they have their own uh, precision farming. So they took up about 100 acres of land. So they plant their own vegetables and uh, veggies. So whenever guests come, the quality is always the same. It's within their control. So the kind of impact that we see from this one, not only jobs within the hotel itself, but also it creates jobs for the local community uh, in terms of uh, agriculture employment. So in summary, I think 
um, there are a lot of things that can be done uh, to create more jobs just looking at uh, Penang as a tourism destination, meaning the job is not only related to the tourism itself, but it will also uh, have multiplier effects to the overall economy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Saleha. All right. Uh, that's good. I think uh, it reinforces earlier why we you mentioned and then also shared by Chung on the medical and uh, heritage tourism and so on. Now, the medical tourism, I think when the government embarked on it and then the private sectors and the hospital sectors came in, it was only one main area. Now, I think you can see a whole spectrum of things are developing. Uh, wellness, uh, people don't come in as patients. You also do not want to tell them that your patients coming to Malaysia to get medical treatment. They want to come for wellness and also health related issues. It's not medical per se, health screening and then diagnostics and various other things and so on. There is one other area uh, we have been looking at it in Malaysia Japan Economic Association. This is the aging society and also the care to be given to the aged and people who have no place in the homes. Uh, now, our, our homes have become only husband and wife and children. And then when the children grow up, they want to get out. The father and mother are left on their own. And then you do not know what to do. So the aging society uh, and others that are related becomes an issue as well. And Penang can take it. There is one more, I think, in other states this is being done. This is the ecotourism, agriculture and agro-related, including forest and also a stay in tea plantations, in rubber estates, in palm oil plantations. And of course, Sabah and Sarawak have got the jungles. So there is a lot of things that is coming in when we talk about tourism. It is an adventure that you are giving to them, not coming for excitement, in only in the urban center. Thank you very much, uh, Zaleha. We have got two more speakers, and I see the concluding address is, uh, I mean, our uh, the, the Halim is ready, is arrived here already. So we quickly get uh, our next speech, uh, speaker, Professor Major uh, Dato Dr. Chin, who has got an expertise in many areas, and he is now also involved in the One Belt, One Road. And therefore, there is a Chinese or China element into Malaysia and also to Penang. And over to you, Dr. Dato Dr. Chen. Thank you very much, Dr. Sri. In the 20th century, oil was the fuel of the economic in this century or 21st century, creativity is the fuel of the economic. So now all the economics uh, activities, you need the element of creativity. That's why now you've got the knowledge economy. Now you've got the what you call digital economy. All stem from creativity. Today I'm going to talk about more on this tourism. Tourism, as everybody knows, is a very major source of income for many countries. Malaysia, I think, is number two major source of income. For painting also, painting, in fact, depends on two pillars. One is the manufacturing, the other one is the tourism. So tourism is very important. Actually, tourism basically, to me, consists of three major components. First thing is nature. Second thing, infrastructure. Third thing, culture. Nature means all the natural attraction. This one is uh, something like endow, certain places endow with certain natural attraction. You have or you don't have. The infrastructure is something like your physical building, your hotel, your resort, all the physical structure you build to attract these uh, tourists. To me, the most important element is still the culture. Culture is the one that really can sustain a country or painting this uh, attraction. Uh, 
means a longer term. Because I have been traveling to the world for 30 over, con to 30 over countries, I see, go for sightseeing all this, you see the, all the natural attraction. Once you come back, you don't really remember. But you talk about culture, then you can remember very well. Especially, I got a new term called the experiential tourism. What do you mean by experiential tourism? That means you go to certain place like Penang. Penang is famous for what? Penang Laksa, Penang this Chao Kui Tiao, uh, Penang this uh, so many foods. Uh. So when the tourists come, you have to teach them how to fry Chao Kui Tiao or how to uh, cook this uh, Laksa. Uh, then they remember better. Or we'll ask them to teach them how to dance a jockey or how to play the lion dance or how to play the kombang all this. Uh. This is what we call the experiential tourism. That means you go and experience, when you travel, you go and experience certain things new, like culture. Because only culture, you, you, you go to a country, you only you can always remember in your mind what is a culture. The natural attraction, actually, you go there, then you forget. That's why I was talking to a, a Belgian, uh, just now I forgot his name. He talked talk to me about Belgium. I remember one or two things only about the square. And then the, the thing, other they can't remember very well because you, the culture is the most important thing. Let's say you go to a certain place, you, let's say you teach them how to fry kui tiao. And then you go back and even 10 years later or 20 years later, you still can remember. Because this is called the experiential kind of uh, traveling. See, this is very important. That's so why I think Penang, not only thinking about how to build more hotels or, or have more natural attraction, actually most important is the culture. You must... Uh, uh, let the, the tourists uh, the experience our culture here. Then the people will remember very well. That's why this is called, I think in this world, you need the, something very competitive. This is called the experiential uh, this, uh, tourism. First point. Uh, second point. Second point is talking about medical tourism. Uh, medical tourism is uh, according to a study, the whole in uh, this uh, now actually the whole spending on the medical tourism is about 55 billion USD. So it covers about 11 million uh, tourists. Uh. So uh, in 2030, the spending on this medical tourism is about 93.9 billion USD. So it's a big sum of money. So and sad to say, one third of this uh, revenue only come to ASEAN. Uh. Two third go to US, European countries, and Middle East countries because they are more of ones. Uh, these are ASEAN countries. Among ASEAN countries, there are three competitors or two competitors. Our, this Thailand is our number one competitor. Singapore is our second competitor. Malaysia is among the top three. Uh, so Malaysia is not so bad, but uh, Thailand is more famous for cosmetic surgery, plastic surgery, sexual transform transformation, all these things. Uh. Singapore is more for diagnosis and uh, treatment like oncology, cancer, heart patient, surgery, all type of surgery. So Malaysia is more for the health screening. That's why I look at the data. In this, uh, they are all together, 840,000 uh, medical tourists come to Malaysia. About half is going to Penang. Uh. Penang is very important for medical tourism. So, uh, 640,000, they are from, all from ASEAN countries. Just now, YB say 60% or 50%, more than about 60% the tourists come from Indonesia uh, for medical tourism. So, uh, because our cost is cheaper and then also our doctors are more professional. Well, yesterday, I was traveling from airport to uh, this hotel. I, I tried to talk to the grab driver. He say, I say, why Indonesian? Patient like to come to Malaysia. He told me one story. Uh, he say, because you go in Indonesia, then you go and see a doctor, they won't treat you one time, cure you one time. He said, they keep on asking you to come back because they want to make money. But Malaysia, they're very honest. When they come here, they treat you just one time, they solve your problem. Already. So that's why, why so many Indonesians like to come to Malaysia. Okay, so medical tourism is very important. Is that uh, you have to really uh, what I call to Malaysia, I think, can be the medical hub of ASEAN uh, because uh, you talk about the environment, the, the tourist attraction, the cultural part, the heritage site is better than uh, this Thailand and Singapore. Singapore is very costly. Only thing 
I think we have to upgrade our medical facilities. We have to bring in more specialists and then uh, nurses. And then we have two more, what I call the high value added kind of uh, surgeries like oncology, heart patient surgery, all these things. I think uh, Malaysia can do better because uh, we attract 640,000 uh, tourists uh, come to Malaysia. Singapore only got 400,000. Uh, this Thailand got 550,000. But in terms of value generated, Thailand and Singapore, the value is higher than us. Okay, I think uh, Tato Sri want to stop me already. So you are very polite, uh, please stop me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, no, I actually didn't want to stop you, but uh, we have the, the concluding remarks uh, um, uh, guest already here, and uh, I think they have an arrangement with the hotel also to end the whole thing at about five o'clock. So we are still all right. We started a little bit late. I just uh, like your experiential tourism. I think that is an important area because um, in some countries, elephant riding, camel riding, all this becomes uh, uh, experiential tourism. And I, for one, in the UAE, in the desert, you don't have anything. You get into a four-wheel drive and you go up and down the sand dunes, I think this is also a remarkable tourism experience. I do not know if this kind of a thing is going to be. I like uh, uh, Mr. Ho Chin Soon's readiness to act on. Now, Ho Chin Soon, I know him um, from, from a long time ago, and I just want to describe one thing about him. If the Survey Department of Malaysia has got the data, how you extract this data and make it available for the commercial, particularly the property sector and so on, he is a genius and he has done extremely well. And I hope you will share with us some of your trade secrets. Thank you very much. Uh, everybody can hear me. I started the clock. Uh, <clears throat> Moderator Iqbal, fellow panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Salamun alaikum, greetings of peace. I told Moderator Iqbal I will be on time. Exactly eight minutes, I'll stop talking no matter where I am. As you can see, uh, the slides there, it has appeared. The first one is population demographics. All of us in Malaysia has to prepare for slower growth rate. If you had listened very carefully to moderator Iqbal, he mentioned aging society. So I'll talk a little bit on that. Then because today we are talking about the future, forward summit for Penang. Uh, as I told you, I'm a Penangite. Eh? Just now, those who didn't hear carefully, let me say again, Pa Cheng Po E Gina. The second part is a little bit easy. The transport master plan is already in the website. The sea reclamation you can see from uh, even the G, G uh, Hotel here, outside is the reclamation and also the islands to the south. The last one, I have only a couple of slides very quickly. <clears throat> Development of Penang Hill. Listen very carefully. It is something sensitive. The Penang NGO are famous. Anything they will object. Okay, last year, December, Penang's population is shrinking. So let me share with you, uh, of course I can talk a lot about Penang because uh, I'm the, the good Penang people went down to KL and Singapore to work. The balance were all the, that means they were the gangsters. Lah. 
<laughs> the leftovers, okay. We have been tracking population statistics for many years now. I'm uh, 66 years old with six grandchildren. Most of the time I win. Uh, but once in a while I meet somebody who has more grandchildren than me, then I keep quiet. <laughs> you look at the statistics, it is falling. And I like to compare Malaysia with Singapore. I'll talk a little bit on that later. So now we are below 1%, still a little bit of growth. This is the population pyramid. Malaysia is still relatively, as you can see, healthy. China is having problems. Singapore is really, if not for migration, Singapore is actually worse than Japan. <clears throat> there was a one-child policy. Now they say you can have three children. The Chinese people in China are not bothered. Why is a global phenomenon? When a country becomes rich, for some reason, the women don't want to give birth. They don't want to get married. <clears throat> in Japan, you can, there are 8 million empty homes. <clears throat> I've taken four minutes of your time, ladies and gentlemen. As I said, the last few slides are very easy. Would you like me to share a story with you? I got time. I got time. I think I will give you the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> When I was active, I used to travel to give talks, uh, Vietnam, Hong Kong, Indonesia, uh, lots of places, including Singapore. And when I'm in Singapore, I like to have some fun with the Singaporeans. Uh, I remember those times Lee Kuan Yew was still alive. And I said, look at your newspaper. Lee Kuan Yew said, one out of three Singapore women don't want to get married. I asked the audience and I said, uh, I mean, Lee Kuan Yew said, look, my daughter is not married. So I asked the audience, I said, who wants to marry Lee Kuan Yew's daughter? Please put up the hand. Nobody put up the hand. Lee Kuan Yew couldn't figure out how to solve this problem. Ho Chi Soon research went to do the research and I found out the answer. You want to hear the answer? Seriously. <laughs> okay, listen very carefully. Huh? So in front of a Singapore crowd, you know, we are very daring. Penang people and Kuan Ma, Bo Kiaya, no fear. I said, you know, the reason why Singapore women don't want to marry because the Singapore men got no class. <laughs> Actually, there's a second part of the story. I will continue if there's opportunity another time. Huh? Uh, maybe KSI will invite me next year, I continue the part two. Lah. <laughs> I got one and a half minutes more, I'm very conscious of the time. Now, how do we encourage migration? We need people to come to Penang. What are the catalysts? As I said, there's only one slide here for uh, Penang transport, transportation plan and the reclamation, the South Islands, and so forth. Because once in a while we say, oh, it's on, then it's not on, then it's on, uh, because your politics come into play, you know? I have wrote a book 13 years ago to ask Penang government to develop Penang Hill. Published 2010, and you know GMP, uh, one of the advisors to the Penang government, 
he was kind enough to actually analyze the cost of a tunnel and to plan for me the, uh, not only the tunnel from uh, Aitam to Balik Pulau, but also his people sat down to do the calculation of how to do a southern road up to Penang Hill. And this is part of the story. Unfortunately, we don't have any more books since 13 years ago. I've already exactly eight minutes, sir. Can I just conclude? I, I, can I ask for another 10, 15 seconds? Uh, okay, yeah, 15 seconds. Thank you, sir. Uh, I was thinking, you know, actually, you could have been a speaker here because you could see the essence of all the things what's happening to Penang. And I have lost the touch because I'm a, like a foreigner. Lah. I can always come to Penang. Sometimes I tell Penang jokes on Penang night. And the Penang people are very sporting. They can laugh. Uh, with that, thank you very much. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ho Jin Soon. Uh, I think uh, with uh, a little bit of a humor, you brought uh, the valuable points. I think that is important. Uh, if you make that kind of a statement about Penang somewhere else in Malaysia, especially East Malaysia, probably you will not get a visa to enter. <laughs> <laughs> so you can get away. The second one is Singapore is missing the point. If the Singapore women do not want to get married, all they have to do is to give an incentive. You get married with the Malaysian women and bring them in. We'll give them the citizenship right away. No problem at all. Singapore doesn't see that. Malaysians go abroad to southern Thailand. They bring one, two, three. <laughs> no problem at all. So with that, let me just conclude I don't think so. I want to give half a minute or one minute to each of them because they have said whatever they need to be said. It has been a lovely a final session on the property, tourism, heritage-related development and how we can enhance this for the betterment and the future of Penang. With that, I would like to ask you to join me in thanking all of them for their panel contributions. Thank you very much. And it has been quite lovely for me to chair the last session moderation uh, and then over to you, Master of Ceremonies, for the final closing address and the closure of this great summit, which has been a wonderful ride from morning until almost five o'clock now. Thank you so much, Dr. Sri Muhammad Iba Router.